Hello everybody, welcome to this video lecture series wherein we'll talk about social statistics and for this first video, I'll try to introduce you to some of the general and basic concepts of statistics. So in this uh, video, we'll talk about the different methods of knowing. We're going to be defining statistics and what we use statistics for. And then we're also going to be talking about some of the concepts that are related to statistics that we should know about before we get into the real stuff. And then we'll talk about how we collect data for quantitative social science research. So let's talk about the different methods of knowing. Where do we usually get knowledge about something that we want to know about how do we ascertain that a certain information about something is a fact and how do we say that we know something is true so the first method of knowing is authority basically in this method of knowing something is considered true because of tradition or because some person of distinction says it's true so, for example, we talk about gender roles. Like, when we were born and we were socialized into this world, um, tradition has told us that there are certain chores in the house that we need to do because we're boys or because we're girls. So, if these are more um, related to cleaning, to caregiving, it is usually something that we assign to girls. And we just know it because... It is what culture is telling us. And if this is something to do with very physical stuff like carpentry or fixing the electricity in the house or the electric components of the house, it's usually relegated to males. And if you act otherwise, you would be ridiculed and say that you are not conforming based on the traditional knowledge and the traditional practices of our culture. And that's, how, and that's one way how authority or tradition kind of rationalizes or justifies the things that we do, at least in the sense of social practices. Um, and then, of course, we also have authority in terms of the person. Like, for example, you know that what I'm, what I'm talking to you about is true because I am in a position that I am a teacher and because of that authority that I have over you, you take everything that I say as knowledge um, because of, you know, the position that was given to me. And probably you also get knowledge from your parents or eventually when you go out of uh, into the economic workforce, we'll talk about your bosses and they'll say that, you know, they know things and that you should follow what they say because um, they know best for the company. Or, for example, when you go out and you jaywalk, you know exactly that you're wrong in terms of what you did because the policeman who caught you or the traffic enforcer who caught you told you that you were wrong. And that's kind of the knowledge that they have because of the authority that they have and the power that has been vested in them. So that's the first method of knowing. And very obviously, in the first example that I gave in terms of gender norms and the traditional gender norms, we know that authority as a source of no knowledge, no tradition as a source of knowledge, while something we can always appreciate, something that we can kind of critique is in a very watery place you know because especially when it comes from authority it's hard to challenge that and it has to be challenged and sometimes there are many um, things that we do and we know traditionally because it's a part of our cultural fabric that are not really based on facts you know? and of course for example for gender norms and for gendered sports we know that we, we have debunked so many things about, you know, men can do caregiving too. Women can be um, can get into combat sports or contact sports and, and such. No? Uh, we were always, um, there was always that traditional knowledge that women can't be leaders or managers or can't lead a, an organization or a country. But we do know now that um, it is not their gender that defines their leadership, no? but it's really what they have done, the knowledge that they have, the intellect that they have, and their people skills and their social skills, etc. 
So, um, that's the that's the watery part in terms of this type of method of knowing. Um, when we when we infer because tradition told us so, or, so, or an, a person of authority told us so, um, sometimes it's not based on facts. And if it's not based on facts, then um, this knowledge can be ineffective or can justify things that are things that are wrong that are happening in society. So that's the first method of knowing authority. The second um, method of knowing is rationalism that uses reasoning alone to arrive at knowledge. If the premises are sound and the reasoning is carried out correctly according to the rules of logic, then the conclusions will yield truth. Remember that in rationalism, we get to hypothesize things based on uh, already built basic knowledge on them. Um, but there's really not yet any form of testing for that specific hypothesis that we have made. So it's more really of an intelligent guess that is really built upon a lot of logical reasonings. And rationalism has its okay times. And there are also times where irrationalism is used and it can be disastrous and it really not leads to what is true, especially in the social sciences. There are those um, uh, string of logical statements that make sense and that can support some of our decisions. Like for example, uh, females are of higher risk um, for breast cancer. That's the first statement. The second statement is um, Michelle is a girl or a woman. No? Ergo, Michelle may have higher risk for breast cancer compared to Pedro, who is biologically male. So that is a deductive reasoning that is based on a sound logical argument. But there are also those who does deductive or inductive reasoning um, that can lead to disastrous and harmful decisions and knowledge just because they want to do, uh, just because of the analogies that they do. No? For example, uh, the usual, uh, for example, you care for your iPad. That's why you, you will put a case on your iPad. Your iPad is like your virginity. So if you want to take care of your body and your virginity, you know, dress up because you need to protect yourself. So that's another example of a really, really far-fetched analogous type of logical reasoning that does not really, is not based on facts. It's, it's, it sounds okay logically, but we know that these types of knowledge that are produced from those kind of deductions quite harmful. Now, for example, uh, 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 Juan murdered somebody. A. B. Murdering is wrong or vile or criminal. Uh, letter C. Um, Juan, is, uh, Juan is someone who has a dark skin color. Therefore, People who have dark skin color are more likely to murder people. And again, there is a, you know, of course, there are a lot of fallacies that are coming into play in the way that I did my logic. But you can see how if these logical statements are not tested, um, they could really be harmful in terms of the decisions that we're making based on those types of argumentations, whether that's deductive or inductive. The third method of knowing is intuition. Intuition refers to a sudden insight, the clarifying idea that springs to consciousness all at once as a whole, usually after conscious reasoning has failed, it is not arrived at by reason. Maybe you know this among other, uh, uh, using other um, concepts or constructs called gut feel right no intuition like you see someone and you kind of get a feeling that you know that that person will be your best friend for life or you see someone and then you feel like something ominous will happen to him or her 
or you uh, see a certain building and you have a feeling that this is going to collapse anytime or you have you you um, you see a brand logo of a company and you already feel some form of attachment to this company and you say I'm going to be working in that company because I have a good feeling about this right so that that's intuition and uh, again it's not based on sound facts no but it's really f- based on um, your intuition no based on your gut feel based on what you feel is best at the moment and sometimes you know um when when you when you you know when it's something that springs into your consciousness something that a creative idea that you have maybe i should do this and maybe something will come up no um it's not necessarily bad no sometimes when it's not a uh it's not a a high stake situation intuition would be good like for example i have a good feeling about this color of ice cream maybe it's going to be tasty so i'm going to try it and then you you are right and i i knew i should have i sh- i knew that i i should have trusted my gut feel and sometimes it's 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 it makes sense no i have a friend who actually did a study on how intuition helps them get into good decisions especially the low stakes decisions um but for high stakes decisions, no, like for example, what schools to fund, what projects to fund, what government projects you need to support, um, I think we have to go beyond intuition. And like for example, um, but sometimes, for instance, you know, choosing a course in college, choosing a degree program, may you know, you may you may want to be using intuition. If, if you want to, I think that will also work for you. But for high stakes decisions, I think intuition shouldn't be the only, you know, shouldn't be the only method of knowing that you have to use you know, in order for you to be able to make a decision about something, especially if it's high stakes. So that's intuition. And finally, we have the scientific method, which both uses reasoning. So when you hypothesize, you, know, you remember when you do scientific method, right? you start with a problem and then after finding the problem, you kind of look at the literature, what is already known about that thing. And then from there, you kind of build some form of hypothesis. You know? um, what could be the things that could be affecting the problem? You know, what, in pro- what probable solutions can you do in order for you to be able to solve that problem? And, you know, the, be- the ability for you to actually be able to see that problem is actually a, a product of your intuition. You know? To be able to actually find a problem, a social problem or a scientific problem is, is also based on your intuition. Not necessarily your gut feel, but basically your creative ideas. You know? And uh, you search for the literature, you make a hypothesis. Hypothesis, by the way, is based on sound reasoning. You know, um, And then, of course, after your hypothesis, you design a study for you to be able to test your hypothesis and then you you know, you you analyze and get the results, and then after getting the results, you make conclusions. No. In addition, it relies on objective assessment. So as I said, no, it ha- there has to be design, there has to be data that has to be collected <clears throat> in order for you to be able to know that something is true or factual. It involves deductive reasoning from existing theories that are already available. So this is the reasoning part or inductive reasoning from existing facts or through intuition no uh, f- for example when you do qualitative research no a large part of that will be reasoning and also a, a, a small part of that is that of course intuition that you come um that that comes to you as you read the data that is presented to you so that's scientific method no so uh, identifying a problem, you know, gathering the literature and learning about the problem, deducing uh, the theories that are available, and then hypothesizing, designing a methodology in order for you to test that hypothesis, and then um, uh, analyzing the data after collecting the data, and then you know reporting the results, and then being able to come up with a conclusion at the end. So that's the scientific method, and this. This is the highest level of knowing among the four that I have um, talked to you about. No, 
Um, because there are many times where in reasoning and intuition, even in the best ways that they're used, can be not true in the real world. No? Especially when you talk about Um, social sciences because you know people are chaotic you know human human nature is not something like in physics where you can like you know um, take the particle out and it can still behave the way it behaves even if that particle is a part of the original group no but in the social sciences and in the health sciences when you take out a certain aspect of humanity or you take out a human from a large social group they will behave differently no so and there are so many and then we talk about behaviors of people you talk about allegiances and perceptions and attitudes of people uh they are very um very chaotic no and there's so many factors that you need to control and most of the time when you do research and scientific method you won't be able to statistically control them all because some of the ways that you can control them can be unethical So, and that's the reason why, you know, when you just rely on reasoning and when you just rely on intuition in making decisions about social issues, when you make decisions about people's behavior, when you talk about organizational decisions, personal decisions, family decisions, and you just, you know, know because this is what authority has told you, this is what your readings have told you, this is what your gut tells you, then... You need to test that. Now, there has to be a way for us to be testing certain things. You know? um, and for instance, let's, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about drug addiction, for instance. So, um, for so long a time, you know, uh, uh, we have looked at addiction and we've looked at it from a criminal lens, you know, thinking of it as a deviant behavior. But when we... And, but, When we started, you know, criminalizing it and we started persecuting uh, people who have drug addiction, we noticed that um, people who have drug addiction aren't really getting better and that the number of people who are addicted to drugs aren't really, you know, decreasing. So, um, so but, you know, reasoning would tell us, you know, if you... Um, If we label drug addiction as a bad behavior and we penalize people for bad behaviors, then most likely people will stop doing drugs. But it, but but the real world in the real world that didn't work, no, for many countries. And so when we take a medical perspective for drug addiction, when we see it as a disease rather as rather than a criminal label, And then we start treating people for drug addiction. We start rehabilitating people with drug addiction. And we also see it not only as a health problem, but we see it as a welfare problem. Meaning people who have mental issues, people who are in poverty, people who are hopeless, um, are more likely to get into situations where they will be enticed to do drugs. Then... Uh, we we were seeing better results. You no, know? when we when we design research, we were seeing better results. If we, if we treat them as as people with certain diseases and we treat them like that instead of treating them as criminals, then it got better. And this is this is you know this is how science grows. This is how our knowledge grows. You no, know? um, maybe our previous intuitions and previous. Uh, previous traditions and previous reasoning and justification and rationalization for a certain social issue doesn't work anymore. It doesn't give us good results. It doesn't seem like a good form of knowledge and therefore we need to challenge that. And that's why we need to put reasoning and intuition together because um, you need to put some form of creativity in order for you to make things work and add your creative thinking into what is already known and from there, you know, be able to look at new intervention, new programs, etc. So, like I said, scientific method is one of the best um, or the best way of knowing. You know? And here, we're jumping off to the reason why we're studying statistics in the first place because especially when we do quantitative methodologies, quantitative scientific methodologies, we would need a tool that will help us mathematically, you know, test our reasoning, test our intuitions. 
So let's define what statistics is. So statistics is a formal science that involves the collection, organization, presentation, analysis, and interpretation of data. So in this um, class, we'll be talking about how do we collect data. Actually, we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, what would be the best way to collect behavioral data, social data, at least that's that's for the social sciences. And then, of course, also we're talking about how we organize the data. How do we, you know, how do we identify variables, what type of variables they are, and how do we code these variables? How do we place them in a statistical software so that they could be understood for testing? Presentation, you know, uh, this is, we are also going to be discussing about graphs, about tables and how to correctly um, format these graphs and these tables. And then we'll talk about analysis. And we'll talk about what mathematical functions or what mathematical equations we're going to use for this study. By the way, we're not going to be talking about, you know, formulas in this class because that's also not something that I have mastery in, but I will do teach you about, you know, choosing this, the correct statistical tool for you, for you to be able to answer your questions that you have, you know, posted in the earlier scientific method or the, ear the earlier steps of the scientific method or the earlier parts of your research, no? And the interpretation. So when you generate certain values, at the end of your statistical tests, do you, are they conclusive? Are they significant? What does it tell you about um, the relationships of the variables of your study? And also, what does it tell you about you know uh, your hypothesis? Is it answering your hypothesis? Is it addressing your hypothesis? Is it nullifying your hypothesis? And things like that. So, why do we do statistics in the first place? Now, what is the use of statistics in our everyday life? And also for people, what is generally its use? No? First is, you know, we use quantitative research ideally for policymaking. No? But, you know, uh, in our country, most of our policies are really, you know, are really intuitive rather than really numbers-based. But, you know, in an ideal world, we use numbers to you know, to um, to be able to um, enact good policies. And, you know, policies are very important in, in society because policies codify social practices um, that will help improve the well-being of the people in a uh, society. You know, it um, identifies groups of people, uh, agencies in the government, private sector um, organizations that are accountable, you know, for people, for them to be protected, for their rights to be appreciated, you know, and to be realized, you know, and for their overall well-being, you know, in all of the aspects of their life. So that's important. And hopefully, we're making policies based on data, based on statistics, rather than just intuitions, you know. We, for example, um, we have a mental health act now, and I would presume that we've done mental health act, or we one of the ways, one of the justifications for mental health act is the increasing number or prevalence of mental health in the Philippines. Although during that time we didn't have really much data, and it is only when we did the mental health act when we enacted it that we're starting to collect a national prevalence data for mental health. No, and then policy making can actually also be. Um, a fuel for future research. No, uh, for example, the HIV law. You know, it 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 was based on the statistics that we know about. I know about HIV. No, for example, the amendment um, improved, for instance, the the consent. You know, because uh, in the in the older law, um, uh, the minors were being required to ask from their fa from their parents consent to the for them to be um for them to be tested of HIV but that's really weird because how can you as a minor go up to your parent and tell you hey I want to be tested for HIV because I have been sexually risky I had I, I engaged in sexual risky behavior so that's that's a that's a that's going to be very um uh, troubling for the for the child to do for the minor to do so uh, and because we had increasing number of younger 
uh, people who are getting infected by HIV. Um, there was a uh, there was a justification, you know, for for kind of watering down that policy of asking parents to sign the consent for them to be tested of HIV. So that's very important. You know, we need numbers for policy making. Uh, and at least no uh, some of the numbers that we need when we present to policymakers, legislators, budget, you know, um, uh, and also the expenses that needs to be occurred, you know, that what and then of course the econometrists, no, they they can also make projections. How much do we save, no, if we, if we if we if we take care of non-communicable diseases now? How much money does the government save, no, if we apply a lot of this? promotive behaviors. Now, if we build a dam here or if we improve the national resilience for disasters of the Philippines, how much do we save? So that those some of the answers to those questions that will inform policies are statistics. Although we will not be answering those questions in this class because we those are really complicated statistics and I personally have no mastery in terms of that. But yeah, those are some of the questions that statistics can answer and can inform policy. Next is simple decision making. You know, uh, when you make decision making um, in your work, in your personal life, in your family life, in school, you know, statistics can help you, you know, make good decisions. You know? Like, for example, when you want to buy a good cell phone, you know, you will compare, you know, statistics of certain things. You know? Even that's descriptive statistics. You know? What would be the average Geekbench scores you know, if you care about those things? Um, um, what is the average time that it gets soaked in the water and then it will malfunction? You know, how waterproof is as this specific cell phone or this specific gadget? So um, maybe, you know, for example, how much does, what is the average um, salary of a person who has this type of degree who gets into this type of of work and maybe that can also be a basis for your decision making for the degree program that you enrolled in so those kinds of things and then also quantitative research is also very um, much needed for theory building or validation so uh, the students that are enrolled in this class during this year <laughs> that this was uh, this video was published most of you will really be using statistics for validating the theories in your specific disciplines and also when you go to higher levels of learning you will also get to learn about how do you build theory using quantitative research for theory validation we will be doing much of that in this class you, know, you have a theory and then from the theory you you generate uh, uh, you generate hypotheses, and then from the hypothesis, you decide on which variables to measure. You measure them, and then you confirm your hypothesis by doing statistical tests. That's validation. But for theory building, it really is a lot more. You know? It uses more complex statistics. Probably, we can learn about them a little bit, no? but we won't be able to do it because this is a little bit of a basic statistics class. Next is experimentation. No? If we want to know if a certain intervention is good for people, then we also use statistics. No? For example, how do we know if a certain, um, a certain for example, no, if I use a certain uh, new educational strategy to teach my students, no? I can use statistics for me to really know if there is a knowledge gap between those who are exposed to my new teaching uh, strategy compared to those who were not exposed to my new teaching strategy. So that's experimentation. But of course, this is really larger when you talk about the health sciences, no? for I, where I'm also coming from. Now, for example, how do we know if a certain vaccine is working and is not working um, from those who are exposed to the vaccine and those who are not exposed to the vaccine? What is the risk that they will be getting the infection? based on the causative agent that is supposedly protected by that vaccine or fought by that vaccine. So that's uh, a form of experimentation. But there are a lot of social experiments that we can do as well. Like, for example, has the quality of life of a community become better prior to a specific program being implemented and years after that program has been implemented? Um, 
probably some of the policies that need some form of statistical validation and evaluation but probably would be the four piece if you know four piece you know um uh and and you know other social welfare policies like that and also um especially in the behavioral sciences we can use quantitative research for instrument construction so for example there are many constructs that need to be measured quantitatively but still have no quantitative measures yet now for example you can measure stress quantitatively there are already scales that you can use to measure quantitatively you can already measure anxiety you can already measure self-actualization self-esteem problematic social media use but as as we go along no as we go along um the history of humankind, there are more and more constructs that are being developed. Like, for example, um, since many people are using TikTok, um, I am assuming that there would be, you know, scientists who would be um, developing a tool to measure TikTok addiction, for instance. Maybe they have developed it now, no? Or, for instance, like a story, you know, we did the research on this, no? There was a group of because of the COVID-19, we are doing everything online and we are all attending Zoom meetings like um, like what we do when we have synchronous sessions. And um, there had been a construct that emerged from our experience in COVID-19. We call Zoom fatigue or video conferencing fatigue. And um, since we are so exposed to this, there might be a need for us to properly measure this quantitatively. And we can use statistics to be able to measure that um quantitatively and there was actually one who did it no uh, and they and they published their work in 2020 and it's also being used we use that specific constructed instrument uh in in some of the research that we have done previously and uh yeah that's uh, and then maybe in the future you no know, uh there are more constructs that are that can be developed. Like, for example, in the Philippines, there are many Filipino-specific constructs that may need some form of quantification to be measured, and quantitative research or statistics can help us be able to make those types of um, to make those types of instruments so that people can make use of the instruments or the scale so that they can measure that for other purposes. Other concepts that we will be using across our uh, lectures first is of course we'll talk a lot about data and data in the context of of statistics is a numerical representation of variables acquired through measurement no so for instance um when we talk about stress then stress can be expressed as a score or anxiety can be expressed as a score or for instance if we kind of qualitatively say it's high low or moderate we still assign a number at least for statistics like for example if it's low then it's one if it's moderate two if it's high it's three or severe is three no um and then for example male and female as a as a variable uh, gender as a variable we assign males one females two based on again um what our code book is saying so basically it, these are numerical representations of the variables but who are what are variables so variables are quantifiable characteristics related to an individual or group of individuals um that we are interested in measuring you know, for example it can be demographic factors like age sex assigned at birth uh, income level of the household, um, uh, whether they live in urban or a rural area, whether they're working or not working, what's the religion, civil status, etc. There can also be the social attributes or the psychological attributes that they are expressing. You know? Like for example, stress, self-actualization, citizenship behaviors, national resilience, okay? Um, and also, we these are not just individuals that can have variables. Group of individuals um, can also have variables. Like for example, a country can be represented by variables like um, gross domestic product. Or a country can be, for example, population of a country is also a variable that represents the unit of analysis, which is a country. 
right? Or an organization, for example, a company, is the how how long has been, what is the age of that company? How, what is the years from the time it was founded until now? So that's the age of the company, right? So remember that when we do statistics, our unit of analysis is not only a person. Although most of the research that we will be doing in our in our, in your ex, in your experience in the undergrad will be through people, no individual people. All right, so that can be those are variables, and it's important that you identify the variable in the study as a step, important step in choosing the appropriate statistics. Because later on, we'll talk about what are the different types of variables in terms of the left scale of measurement. We'll talk about nominal variables, ordinal variables, interval, and um, uh, ratio level variables. Um, but I would like to remind you that this is supposed to be a, re a review because those conversations, you've already had them in your junior and senior high. So hopefully you just, you know, look at your notes from these earlier moments in your life and see um, and review. You know, so that when you, when, you, when you peruse through these videos, you already have some form of idea. You can kind of call it out from your storage memory, memory and you can understand better the more complex stuff. And of course, the forever, again, I hope that you've learned this in your senior high or your junior high, no? Uh, in terms of the relationship of the variables being tested in the study, we have the independent variable and the dependent variable. So the independent variable is the assumed cause, no? And the dependent variable is the assumed effect, no? Or the independent variable can also be called a predictor variable. It can also be called an antecedent variable, meaning it is the, the variable that happens before the other variable. And the dependent variable, in some cases, can also be called the outcome variable. No? So, for instance, when you talk about the relationship between, let's say, um, let's say mental health and quality of life, no? So, in logically, no, um, the the assumed cause in this relationship is mental health. So that's the independent variable. Quality of life is the assumed effect. So that's going to be the dependent variable. Now it is based on your sometimes the temporality of the relationship will be kind of messy or kind of unsure of. For example, when we talk about stress. Right? And let's say academic performance. Academic performance measured as your grade. So, um, it can be that stress is the assumed cause and that when you are stressed, you can have poor academic performance. But there's also that storyline wherein you have poor academic performance, hence you get stressed. So, it's really important for you to be able to define the variables and kind of articulate the hypothesis well in your story, which comes first and which is the assumed cause, which is the assumed antecedent, which is the assumed predictor. No? And it's always very important to really zero in on the type you know, on the specific type of variable that you're measuring. Like, for example, if you measure stress like as a general thing, it makes it harder for us to say that, you know, is, is this the independent or the dependent variable, especially if we're going to use the statistics that I'm going to use to you, for uh, that I'm going to teach you, because they're quite basic and they're not really like telling you certain directions no, or paths as we as we would say in statistics but if we are more specific about you know stress like for example um when we talk about stress there are different measurements that are related to specific types of stress like academic stress so there are measurements of the specific variable of academic stress you no know? or for example when you look at uh when you look at people who are going to undergo surgery soon, there's also what we call... So, we can... Sorry, before that, no? Before the surgery thing, uh, let's say there is a measurement for anxiety, but anxiety is too general, you know? So, you maybe can look for a, for a specific type of anxiety. Like, there's, there's a pre-operation or pre-surgery anxiety, and there are specific measures for pre-surgery anxiety. And that would be a better measure for surgery outcomes 
because it is specifically contextualized to to that specific context you know so there so independent and dependent variable it's basically a review of what you've had for junior high and senior high so what are the different ways that uh, we can collect data in social statistics and social research? The first one, we have the registration method. So the registration method is uh, basically the um, uh, where you, you, you use you know, civil registry or there's a censusing that is used uh, in order for us to collect data. So it's in census. No? Uh, so that's one. So that's the registration method. Next, we have the direct or the interview method wherein you collect the data by talking to the person and then you kind of key in the values as they give you the answers. And then we have the indirect or the questionnaire or survey method wherein you give them the questionnaire and they answer the questionnaire for you. And most of the time no, in our thesis, so this is what we're going to be using for our quantitative research because this is the most convenient. The, the disadvantage for the use of indirect or questionnaire method is that since you're not there, they're answering it, especially online, and you're not there, uh, they can, you know, if they un misunderstood the question, they can't come to you and ask you. Unlike, for example, in the interview method, you can actually answer them if they have questions in relation to the, the items of the specific questionnaire that you're using. And then we can also do observation method. Um, for uh, observation method is you know you not really talking to anyone or getting verbal responses whether written or oral from someone to get the data so for example of observation method is time and motion study so for example um you are uh, you are in a specific place where you are observing and then there are certain people that you are watching and then you are trying to collect the data and observing them, you know, at what time did they start this specific task and at what time did they end that task. So you're observing them instead of asking them uh, in terms of how much time they give uh, or they, they spend using a certain task. And then we have the experimentation method wherein this is for experiments wherein the independent variable is manipulated by the researcher. So for example, of the experimentation method is for example, you want to test if a certain um, infographic will improve the knowledge of people in terms of climate change. So you group the people um, into two. The first group is the experimental group. The experimental group will receive the, um, the intervention in the study. The the control group will not receive so for the experimental group you expose them you give them the copy of the infographic about climate change and then after that you give them you give experimental group and control group the questionnaire on climate change and then you score them and then you compare whether or not there is higher score of climate change knowledge for those who are exposed to the uh, to the infographic compared to those who were not exposed to the infographic. So the, the, the manipulation of choosing who are the ones who is going to be exposed to the experiment or the intervention or the experimental variable is called the experimentation method right, of data collection. Um, it's really tricky to do experiments in the social sciences, uh, but we do them. But... Uh, at least in the context of the thesis that you're going to be doing in your college life, you won't be doing a lot of experiments. So in this video lecture, uh, we talked about the different methods of knowing. We talked about the significance and the waterloo of each method of knowing. And then we defined statistics. We enumerated the ways that we use statistics for the important things that needs to be done individually and as a society. And we also talked about the different concepts like data, variable, independent and dependent variable. And we also talked about the different ways we can collect data that we can use for statistical tests later.